Our second passage that we're reading today comes from Mark 15. Today is Palm Sunday, but it's often referred to also as the Passion Sunday because this begins the Holy Week that we recognize all of those events that led up to Jesus' crucifixion. And while people were praising him, welcoming him, welcoming him into the city of Jerusalem, there were also those who were meeting to wish him harm. And so we think in our minds about all of the things that happened during this particular week, and our scripture today picks up where that ends. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who crucified with him, those crucified with him, also heaped insults on him. <clears throat> At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, they said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he had died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Let us pray. Lord, these words just hurt our hearts because we know the story, and yet we still can't even imagine how painful it was, how scary and terrifying and just all of the things and the thoughts that were running through people's minds, the derision that happened when Jesus was on the cross, cross from the people standing there and the mocking and the just different things that were happening in the midst of his pain and his anguish. And yet, Lord, we know that there is more to that story. We know there is more coming, and yet they did not. They knew or felt that this was the end. And so, Lord, as we go to these moments, as we reflect on these, uh, everything that we've read here, the, the things that we know about this week, we know that you walk with us through all things, that you walked with Jesus through all things, and yet these things happened. And so, Lord, as Pastor Mike comes forward this morning, we just pray that your words are ones that come through him loud and clear, that they will touch our hearts, that they will add to what we already know or what we think we know, and help us to understand and to come to know you and love you more through all of this. Uh, he is your messenger. 
He is the one who is going to bring your word to us, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And I know that a lot has already happened in this worship service this morning, the procession of the palms, the wonderful uh, gathering of our children coming in, our praise team, and I still want to say welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you that are here at uh, Marion Methodist Worshiping uh, Live. We keep seeing a few more of you uh, each week, and we're glad for that, and we welcome all of you that are part of the church online. Now, because some of you come to the 1022 service, I'm going to share some uh, things about what's coming up Holy Week this week, because Holy, Holy Week is that time where we commemorate um, the call that God has all of us to, to grow in our relationship to Christ through, through the passion of our Lord. So beginning tomorrow morning, we'll have a daily opportunity, only as the church online, there won't be any activity actually happening here, but through the church online to be blessed and inspired uh, and challenged through some Lenten moments. I could tell you a little bit about them, but uh, I'd rather show you a brief, brief preview. I had the head of a Christian, but had yet to develop the heart of a Christian. We were concerned about the size when we moved here, but we found out that it doesn't matter the size when you're part of God's family. God creates opportunities that we may not even know that we want or that we may even need. And number there is a time when you will meet a crossroad and will have to decide where your faith stands. Looking back now, I know that fear was from the devil trying to keep me from coming back to God and to church. So those will all drop at 7 o'clock Monday through Friday, and you're encouraged then, of course, to share them, uh, view them, and we hope hundreds of our friends will be part of our Lenten moments. Now, Monday, Thursday, uh, this event is only in person, so those of you on the church online, uh, we can't offer that to you because it's hard to push communion through the little eye that I'm standing on, the back, of, looking at at the back of, of the sanctuary. Um, but we'll have communion at two different times, at noon and then again at 5 p.m., and, and those times are relative in the sense that you come when you desire, and we'll gather a small group out in the center, and then either Vicki or I will come bring you in, uh, share a, a brief devotion, have some time for you to serve, uh, receive communion, and then go out. So um, those, that was a blessed time last year. We enjoyed it very much, and so um, you don't have to come at 5. You can come at 5.40 or whenever and still uh, find time. Uh, to be there. So come to that. Good Friday. Uh, we will have our Good Friday service where we commemorate what Christ has done for us on the cross. That's at 7 p.m. Uh, it will be live in the sanctuary. Also, of course, broadcast uh, online as, as that church. And of course, on uh, Glorious Resurrection Easter Sunday, uh, we will have our in-person worship services and online services at 8.15 and 10.15. And we're encouraged, uh, we encourage all of you to come. Now, as has been said here a few moments ago, the Christian year today commemorates Palm Sunday all the way to the passion of the Christ, Jesus. We know, and we saw a version of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. This, there is at this a triumphant entry to Jerusalem at this Palm procession proclamation, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes as the name, uh, in, as the king of Israel, Jesus, the son of God. There is this faithful fanfare that points to Jesus as, as they rip uh, palm leaves off and as they throw their cloaks before him as he rides on the donkey into Jerusalem. There is this faithful fanfare that says, this is our king. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the Christ, the Messiah of God. We know that that's what the faithful were saying. And the powers that be, those that controlled the religion, which is different than faith. Religion is the faith, uh, the gathering of those that have faith. They saw their power being eroded and challenged, so their pushback was hard. They came with challenges uh, you know, they challenged Jesus with in, in insurrection, and these charges were, were, were alleged against him. And they began to manipulate bit by bit through intimidation and chicanery, 
the crowds that were gathered there, and, and, and they began to generate fear, not faith. Among those who had seen Jesus' miracles, among those who had seen Jesus and, and witnessed his authoritative teaching, and the mob who one day, on a Sunday, had cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, waved palm branches and led them before him. Before those palm branches on the street in Jerusalem had even turned brown, their cry called to crucify him, crucify him. And at the hands of wicked men on a Friday, Jesus will die. Jesus is praying. Peter's are sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday, Jesus is buried. A soldier stands God, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Amen. Amen indeed. Sunday is coming. But right now, it's Friday. I want to take a look at the Friday world of today. Every day, every night, we see these horrors on our screen. We see little boys and girls, mothers and fathers, bodies strewn about a street in the country of Ukraine. We see war tearing up their country. We see those kind of things in different ways happening in our own country. It's not just happening on the screens. It's happening in people's lives. 
We're living in a Friday world right now. And you know this too, some of you, because I talked to some already this morning, others of you over the past days or week have had some sort of diagnosis, some, some sort of calamity in, in, in your family or, or beyond or in a family member, some sort of diagnosis of something very difficult and hard because you see, we're living in a Friday world and I know that some of you have, are living in the land of the broken heart. Whether it's loneliness or separation or conflict that's overwhelming you right now, that's all seemingly everywhere you look, it's because we're living in a Friday world. And we see last week a slap on television. We say, oh, we talk a lot and we have this or that. But is it not an image of a culture that's breaking down? Do we not see in that there is a Friday world happening that cultural and personal morality is dropping down and whatever I think at the moment seems to be the right thing, but that's not right. That's living in a Friday world. What, what our culture desires to feed us, whether it's on social media or television screens or what's put into our ears via media, we are being fed a Friday world. We're living in a Friday world. And I want to tell you a little bit about the Friday world of Jesus. Jesus is beaten beyond the ability for a 30-year-old man to carry a 100-pound crossbar about 1,000 yards. He's beaten so badly. The insults and humiliations pile on one. People spit on him, beat him, punch him, put a crown of thorns over him. And then you see in this line, this line in the Gospel of Mark that Vicki read a few moments ago, one of the most un understated lines in Scripture simply says, and they crucified him. And they crucified him. The world of antiquity would have seen that as horrifying because they knew what crucifixion means. They knew that crucifixion was the most awful death, the most awful way to kill someone because that's why the Romans thought it up. They thought, what will take the longest? What will be the most painful? What will make a statement to the community to fall into line with us? So when it says, and they crucified him, everyone in that timeline would have known, oh my goodness, and you know he knows. You know Jesus knows. Unquestionably, he is feeling the flesh being pulled off his body. He's seeing the air going out of his lungs. He knows he's dying. And that's when, in full consciousness of what's going on, you hear this full-throated, guttural call, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, when we look at the scripture and we look at the history of antiquity, we find that Jesus did not die the ordinary death of one who is crucified. Normally when a man was crucified, it, it, it really the death would come from severe exhaustion and shock and asphyxiation, eventually allowing that person to drift into a coma, oftentimes taking two to three days. But as we read the story of Jesus, it's a six-hour death. The process is not even a full day. And Jesus is fully conscious to the end, which is not the typical methodology in which a man dies of crucifixion. His death was quick, and it was voluntary, which is why Pilate and all the soldiers were surprised. But first, he does say, Eloi, Eloi, Lema, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you left me here alone? You know, as a young parent, I, of course, had young children. And their young, my young children, like all young children, depended very much on their father for some sort of protection. And oftentimes, when we'd walk up to a street corner or when something would be going on that they weren't quite sure upon, I'd see this little hand reaching up, and they'd say, Hand, Daddy, hand! And I'd grab their hand, which, since they've lived to adulthood, I assume comforted them, because it did comfort them. Their fear was pushed back a little bit. And when Jesus says, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, what he's expressing is from the depth of his spirit. All my life, all of his life, he experienced closeness, intimate closeness with the Father, the, the community of God. But now, but now he's saying, in my darkest moment, where are you? Where are you? And it's important for us to understand that Jesus did not merely feel abandoned. 
on the cross. Richard Stockner wrote, no other sentence in all of Scripture is so difficult to understand. Now, while Stockner wrote lots of books, I disagree with him completely. I understand the, world, the, the words perfectly. I just don't want to understand them. And neither do you. Yes, for many Christians, this, this line, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me, is very troubling. We don't want it there because it makes us think, well, what? Did Jesus doubt? But here's what we also know. I want you to, to unpack this a little bit in your own spirit and mind today. We know that first century Christians were the ones that compiled the scriptures. And no first century Christian would have added that line unless it was true. And by the way, it's in all four Gospels. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Nobody would have added that line, a line of aloneness, loneliness, doubt. Clovis Chappelle, a great preacher of the last century, said, this is not bad news. Because to be our Savior, Jesus needed to know abandonment. He truly needed to be fully and completely alone to know what it's like to be fully human. Jesus truly experienced the horror of separation from God. Jesus bore the curse of sin and God's judgment on our sin. And dying for sinners required him, it required him to be separated from God who cannot look on sin. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, there is this line that says, but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. So Christ, to take on the worst of us, chose the horrifying and terrifying to be separated from God. He died forsaken by God so that we might claim God as ours and never be forsaken. See, I've heard through the years, faithful Christians, many of you, faithful young Christians, when asked to say, well, what, what, what helps you? What, what do you think about when you think of God? And you'll say, well, he's always there for me. He never leaves me alone. And it's because of this that we say that. And, and others I've heard saying, well, I, you know, I believe in, in the Lord because he never abandons me. And it's because of this. It's because of the cross of Christ. It's because he was willing to be forsaken by God in those moments so we shall never be. And I want to tell you this. Hopefully you've been listening to, to me up till this point and, and paying attention, but I'm going to share with you now the most startling phrase of the sermon today, and I pray you're ready. Belief is not tied to a miracle at the cross. It's not. Those that were jeering him says he saved others, but he can't save himself. And you know why? If you've been here the last few weeks and been reading Mark, you would know that Jesus predicted that he would not perform a miracle at the cross. He was going there for the purpose that he executed there. There's not going to be a miracle at the cross. Through the cross, yes, your forgiveness, my forgiveness. Because of the cross, yes, resurrection and defeat of death and the granting of life eternal. But at the cross, no and absolutely not. Yet, yet, the first confession of Christ as the Son of God is a result of witnessing how he suffered and died. This pagan Roman centurion who's standing at the foot of the cross, who heard the cry, my God, my God, why have you left me out here alone? and saw how he died is the first human to accurately confess Jesus Christ's true identity, saying, surely this man was the Son of God. It was not Jesus' wonder-inducing miracles that caused him to say, surely this man is the Son of God. It was not Jesus' authoritative teaching that caused him to say, surely this man was the Son of God. It, it was not that. It was the suffering that conquered human blindness to his identity. It was in witnessing Jesus' death and suffering that he came to proclaim that. And so the climax of Mark's gospel 
is not that suffering is relieved because of the cross. Hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not saying. The climax of Mark's gospel is, is not that suffering is relieved because of the cross. In fact, in fact, just the opposite is called for by Jesus. True discipleship is a call to share in suffering and death. Because sometimes there is not a happy ending. We know that. Sometimes there's not a happy ending. We're, we're given permission by our Lord to admit all is not well with us. And we can do that faithfully. Because sometimes there's no happy ending for us. And it's important for us to feel not unchristian because things aren't working out the way we had hoped they would or that we even see a positive physical outcome coming. You know, I've been to Israel a number of times and one of the things that's interesting when you're standing at the hill of the skull or at Golgotha is when you look out away from the skull and look out towards the city, right below you, there's a bus stop, a big bus stop where buses are coming and going. It's bustling because, of course, you know, Israel's not a Christian country. So while they see the skull there and know that it's uh, part of our heritage, it's just in kind of right outside the, the walls of the holy city of Jerusalem and stuff is going on. When you're at the cross, it's right in the middle of things. And sometimes, right in the middle of everything and everyone, we can faithfully admit that everything is not okay. It wasn't okay at Calvary. Sometimes right in the middle of everything and everyone, we, we can ad faithfully admit that there's not a happy ending in the situation that we're in. That this is the comfort this is the faith our world needs today. Often, maybe most times, there is not a pithy verse that you can put on a coffee cup to erase the reality that all is not well with us. There is not a catchy song that we can sing that will erase the reality that not all is well with us. And it is not unchristian to admit or believe this. It is not unchristian to admit or believe this. It is following the way of a Lord who cries, Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthani. Real faith admits hardship. When we cry out to God, we also believe that the worst of the worst will not crush us. We realize when we cry out to the authority that can solve it, that can help us, we know that the worst of the worst will not crush us. Years ago, I was at Summer Games, which is a big deal to me. 500 and so kids down at the Grinnell College campus, 60 or 80 college students leading them, which is a fantastic part of my life, you know. And I woke up, not with a toothache, but with a toothache. You know what I'm talking about? And I, I thought, man, there's something in my mouth that's not usually there, and there was a bump right here in, inside my lip. And I, of course you know, real romantically going to the bathroom and look at it and say, well, that's gross, all right? But I'm, I'm in like toothache, sell your house kind of pain. You know what I'm saying? You'll give anything to re resolve that toothache. So I'm at Summer Games. I don't want to leave, but I know I'm not going to survive this day without doing something about this. So I cried out. I, I know I can't solve this by myself. I had some tools in the car, but not the ones that I was going to need to solve this. But I knew I could not withstand it, and I could not solve it myself. So it was in that hardship I called out to my friend, Dr. Tim Michaels, who's my dentist, and said, dude, you can't let this ruin summer games. And I drove to Cedar Rapids. He saw me real quick and sent me right downtown Cedar Rapids to this woman that specializes in, like, root canals. And I'm telling you, man, I broke this tooth off when I was, like, 12, and so there was a cap on it. She had drilled a hole through the cap. I'll tell you what, the, the needles alone, I'm a fairly tough old guy, but I was crying like a little girl. No offense to little girls. <laughs> and when this lady put her knee on my chest and started drilling, oh my goodness sake, the pain. There was no, of course, then it immediately went away when she solved it. But I knew, like we know about some of our other situations, that what's in front of us, we cannot withstand, nor can we solve it ourself. Our life situations, our things are real hardships, and we, we cannot always withstand them or solve them ourselves. And we cry to God in faith, and we should cry to God in faith, because God 
will not allow us to be crushed. This is the nature of the cross. The cross demonstrates that we must find God at work in the sufferings of the present. On the cross, Jesus does not come to explain or to do away with our suffering. He comes to fill it with his presence. He comes to fill our void, our difficulties, our fears with himself. There's a story of a chaplain during the Vietnam War, and there was a Marine that had come to him, and he said, Padre, I, I need you to pray. I'm going out on a mission and I simply want you to pray that I'll get back here safely. And the chaplain says, I can't pray for that. I can't do that. But I will go with you. See, Christ neither explains away, nor does he remove our sufferings. But when we call upon him, he comes. He comes alongside us in them and fills them with our present with his presence that is what we need in our difficulties we need christ to fill our void our brokenness our forsakenness our loneliness with his presence the core of the gospel message is that god is in sovereign control even in the face of our worst human situations this week we face, we commemorate, and seek to come to grips with the necessity, the reality, and the message of the cross of Christ. So I leave you with this. Sunday is coming. And with God's help, we can live through Friday on the way to it. Sunday's coming, and we give thanks to God. So during this whole Lenten season, this time of preparation, the 40 days plus seven Sundays, we have been sharing this Lenten prayer as the conclusion of our service, a prayer written by John Wesley 250 years ago that still fills a spot in our world today. It does talk in this prayer, and I want you to hear it, about the Friday world that we're living into, and it leans forward towards the Sunday that's coming in hope and certainty. And so I'd ask that as they put it up on the screens that you would please rise and say this prayer with me as we prepare to go out in the world today. Let's use our voices together. O oh, merciful Father, do not consider what we have done against you, but what our blessed Savior has done for us. Don't consider what we have made of ourselves, but what he is making of us for you, O oh God. May his precious blood cleanse us from all our sins and your Holy Spirit renew and sanctify our souls. May he crucify our flesh with its passions and lusts and cleanse all our brothers and sisters in Christ across the earth. Amen. You are the people of God, his beloved. Go in peace and serve him. Amen.